ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nancy Eisenberg and TJ Styles to the stage. Any questions? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it, it's, it's a, again, you've heard this before, you'll hear it again. It's a real pleasure and honor to be invited. And uh, it's just a delight. The roster of authors shows that the, the organizers of this festival really know what they're doing. It's really impressive. And it, it's my honor to be on stage with Nancy uh, Isn't Eisenberg. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it, she had actually suggested that we have a conversation, the two of us have a conversation about history and its uses and misuses. And, uh, um, and then I w suggested, well, let's just make sure we include lots of specifics so it's not an abstract discussion. So w why don't I shut up at this point? Yeah, I <laughs> mean, part of the reason that I thought this would be a good idea uh, is that my husband and I, we write for Salon.com when politicians or public figures say something and claim it's historically correct when it's not. <laughs> so I got very interested in this question about what is the relationship between what historians know versus how most people get their historical knowledge. Um, and I even kind of explore that at the beginning of White Trash. I talk about the importance that history often has a very nationalistic bent. History, this is something that the famous historian Bernard Balin once mentioned, is that when history is happening and people are even reacting to it, often it, it fits uh, a morality tale or is very didactic. And it often takes distance from the events for people to measure the events and judge them more objectively. Uh, so we live in it, and today, the other reason I wanted to do this is because, as I was talking about in the last session, I have written a biography of Aaron Burr, so I've been writing op-eds and comments about the problems with the musical Hamilton and why it's not history. It is entertainment, and I don't want to detract from anyone's enjoyment about the jokes or about the music, but as we know, uh, in Hollywood, on TV, uh, they don't have to adhere to the same rules that historians do about evidence. And I'm one of those, and, and TJ is as well, uh, who believes that history means you go into the archive. It's long hours in the archive. It's tracking down documents and materials that maybe other people haven't looked at. You have to, if you want to claim something's true, you have to look at the original source. You can't just rely on what someone else has said. So I feel as if we are also in a moment right now, as we well know, where facts don't seem to matter, where expertise is being dismissed. Uh, and I find that quite troubling, not just because I devoted my life to becoming a professional historian and take that seriously, but I think it's very dangerous for today's democracy when we don't have a respect for the truth. It doesn't mean you can't have disagreements, or it doesn't mean that, that the facts can be questioned, but it doesn't mean there aren't facts, because there are. <laughs> so this is part of the reason I thought it was important that we think about history and appreciate it not just as a source of entertainment, but also I think it's, it's, it's an important part of defining who we are as a nation. Um, and that we have to appreciate history, not just the happy stories or the spin stories that make us feel good about ourselves, but we also have to realize that our history is complicated and it has lots of things in it that we may be embarrassed by, we may find shameful, but to embrace it all and appreciate that tells us more about who we are today and the problems we have today because that it's not the old cliche that history repeats itself, but the past, the structure of our government, the nature of democratic practices, these things do shape what happens, what happened before does shape what happens today. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting how if you approach the past looking for affirmation for your views in the present, um, the, the, a kind of um, scriptural reading to, to, to um, you know, show that your religious views are, are the true script reading of the scripture, and that, that happens a lot with the American past. 
And, and of course, if you, you actually work in, in the background, you realize things are so different. I, you know, I, I was mentioning this before. Usually when Hollywood is doing a historical movie, they hire a, uh, um, somebody who is a historical consultant. But it's all about the, the, you know, getting the physical details right. Is the hairstyle right? Is the costume right? Um, whereas what we're doing is trying to get into the mindset to understand the culture. And let me give an example of that. Um, in, I think it was 1859, the New York Times introduced a new cliche into American uh, vernacular when it compared Cornelius Vanderbilt to the robber barons. And interestingly, <laughs> it didn't actually say robber baron, but it said like the old barons and the German on the Rhine. And, but now we, we use the term robber baron to mean an industrialist who was a monopolist and crushed out competition. John D. Rockefeller is a good example. But the reason that, that the New York Times called, compared Vanderbilt to the robber barons is because he was too competitive, that he was actually competing against a government subsidized company that provided steamship connection between Goldrush, California, and the East. And the, the founder of the New York Times um, Henry J. Raymond, was an old Whig. And the Whigs had a view of, of national development where government would harmonize the interests of different classes and would work cooperatively with the wealthy to put investments toward projects that were considered to serve the public good. So the Pacific Mail Steamship Company had been set up just before the gold rush started with a large federal subsidy to provide a connection to this new conquest from Mexico it's a completely different kind of political narrative that they were speaking to. And so the, the, that same editorial said it's high time our commercial community looked the curse of competition in the face. And that, um, you know, the idea of competing, th in a competition there's a loser. And in a developing republic, that means capital that is invested and in businesses that are created are going to fail and disappear. So for the conservatives of the time, it's not pro-business versus anti-business. It's different ideas about um, how society develops and the role of government and its relationship. With it. I don't have to go into all the details, but we now have this cliche that means something completely different from when it was created because our entire political matrix, the way we argue about things, has changed because the economy has changed, because political parties have arisen and new ideologies, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and Vanderbilt went on to become the sort of person that we now consider a robber baron in some respect, in other respects not. But the point is, is that you get inside the mindset of the times and all of a sudden, all of your pieties of today fall apart and they disappear. Right. No, and I think it's very important. This is one of the things I did in White Trash. Um, it's really important to appreciate the language that people use at the time. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I became very aware of is that even very good historians we're not paying attention to the language. So they would talk, when they would describe Western migration or manifest destiny, they would use the more neutral term settler. Well, that m completely papers over the way in which actual people living at the time talked about who were the poor that were moving West. So one of the things I was able to do in White Trash is I trace the origins of White Trash, most historians see that as principally a southern thing that began in the antebellum period. But I could trace it all the way back to the 1500s, where the British, and the British are actually really important in my book, because even though we had a revolution, we inherited their culture, their legal system, and their language. The British referred to the poor that they were going to dump into the colonies as waste people. And then I tracked the changing language. The word cracker is something that began in the 18th century. And it comes from another British term because the British obsession was they hated people who were idle. Idleness was the same way we talk about lazy people. They were obsessed with idleness. And a cracker <laughs> goes all the way back to a poem that was written in the 1500s, which said that, you know, 20 crackers are, with, are, are worth two haymakers. So they were people who were seen as lazy, they were noisy, and they were disruptive. And I kept tracing that language. Um, when was redneck introduced? To, to sort of embrace how, even though there's a consistent obsession with blaming the poor, still what you, you see happening 
is you uncover the politics of the time, the prejudices of the time, and the way they organize their world. And one of the things I think TGI and I both believe is that even though there's an impulse when we read history to look for connections, to assume that these people are speaking to us, but it's also an alien world. We have to appreciate that in many ways they don't believe in our values, mm -hmm. that they are really different. And that, I think, is healthy because then when we try to assess how does America evolve, and it doesn't just always evolve in a progressive way, but how does it evolve? Um, and then we appreciate that change uh, that instead of sort of assuming that the, that the world has always been that way or that there's universal impulses that never change, when we get into the details, we get into the nuance, not only do we appreciate these people in their time, but we have a greater sense for trying to understand the past on its own terms. And I think that's actually really important um, because it's also about not trying to impose what we want or to take from historical figures and make them like us. Uh, because differences, we have to embrace difference. Um, and this is, this is often something that's very hard to do because popular history often is marketed because it is telling a story that's about today, as the Hamilton musical, which is really Hamilton for the age of Obama. That's really what that is. Um, so that makes us feel good, but it's not really teaching us how to understand the past and what we can really learn from the past. Instead of blaming people or thinking that it's just villains and heroes. <laughs> you know? Just like if you were to assess your life and, and the bad mistakes you made and, and how complicated that you can't see into the future, we have to kind of have that same respect for historical figures as well. Yeah, I, you know, that's, it's a very interesting point because, um, well, you, you are an academic historian. I'm, I'm not in the academy. I, was, I went to graduate school, was trained as a historian. Then I worked in, in publishing for 10 years. And the idea of, of in adding to our knowledge but also writing uh, something with literary merit really became my mm -hmm. funding point. So I've always had friends and contacts in the academy, people who've reviewed my manuscripts and give me advice, et cetera. So, um, and at the same time, you've written, um, you've engaged in biography, your Aaron Burr biography, I thought was mm -hmm. terrific. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's interesting about biography as a way of addressing history is one, it's, it's, it's a way of engaging, uh, you know, a broad range of readers because it's a contract with the audience. You're going to get a life story. It's about a mm -hmm. human being. Mm -hmm. But also that the individual human beings are complicated and messy. And <laughs> if you're writing about broad strokes, that, that's kind of difficult. Or if you're looking for a morality tale, that's, that's difficult. Yeah. And you know, my most recent subject, Custer, is a good example of this. Here is someone who uh, was from southern Ohio, uh, largely settled by um, people who come across the Ohio River. The whole definition of where the South and North are divided is actually very, very hazy in the 19th century. Christopher Phillips has written some wonderful stuff about this. And his father is from Maryland. He had a very kind of Southern looking um, I outlook culturally and politically. When he became a general in the Civil War, he had this kind of outlandish costume, black velveteen with gold braid that <laughs> wound up from his, his cuff up to his elbow. Mm -hmm. There were generals who dressed like that. They were all southern generals. <laughs> uh, and yet, yeah. here's somebody who was very conservative politically, yet stood by the Union, you know, in that kind of border state unionist tradition. Mm -hmm. He was also somebody who was firmly against emancipation, and yet through his contact with his desire to win the war and his contact with enslaved people, including Eliza Brown, who's a young black woman who had escaped, who he hired as his cook, who then t expanded her role to becoming kind of a household manager. She becomes this major presence in his life, who also is outspoken on um, uh, racial issues of racial justice, and who's also realizes she has to take advantage of any possible advantage she can get. So she's taking food out of the general's mess and distributing it to other escaped slaves, building her own patronage network. She's not a saint, she's a human being in the world. And he's not a villain, he's a human being in the world. So by the end of the war, he has come to see slavery as evil. His personal exposure has changed his views. Well, she is someone who is 
also, you know, she's not out to be a saint and political crusader. She's, she's trying to build security and safety for herself, even though she is having an effect in Custer as well. And then what happens? After the war, Custer reverts and becomes more and more conservative, and he gets himself into trouble by, dab by getting involved in politics as an army officer, opposed to Reconstruction, which introduces the first Civil Rights Act that, you know, changes the Constitution that we still rely on for civil liberties today. And, you know, the, the tension between Eliza Brown and Custer's wife, Libby, build. And you see a white woman and a black woman dealing with a new racial world, a new, a new a world in which everything's up for grabs. You don't, they don't know how it's going to turn out. They don't know where the rule, what the rules are because they're all being changed. And so what's interesting is, you know, when we get into biography, if it's historically honest, mm -hmm. if you really are willing to engage in the complexities of human beings, and also the difficulties and complexities of history. It's a, I found it's a, it's a nice way of, of actually engaging with how complex history is and how complex people are. And, uh, and that's part of the difficulty is the naughtiness of history. It doesn't fall into the neat lines we would like. Right. No, I mean, and the sl slavery issue is very controversial. I mean, if you think about Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr on the slavery issue, um, Alexander Hamilton, yes, he belonged to the Manumission Society in New York, but so did many slave owners. Slave owning in New York is quite bizarre. Most slave owners uh, had slaves that they kept as personal servants that was a status symbol, uh, which was very different from the South, where slavery was much more integrated into agricultural production. But we can't sort of imagine that, that Hamilton was an abolitionist in any way, shape, or form uh, you know, like William Lloyd Garrison. Basically, Hamilton's father-in-law uh, owned 27 slaves. Uh, and even Chernow, who loves Hamilton and defends him, had to admit that there is a document which proves that Hamilton purchased at least two slaves. And either those slaves he kept for himself and his wife, Eliza, or he actually bought them uh, for uh, Angelica Schuyler and Angelica Schuyler's hu husband, John Barker Church. Um, so this is what makes life complicated. In Aaron Burr's case, he defended slaves who wanted to uh, insist on their freedom from their slave owners. He also owned a slave, which he educated. Uh, his daughter would end up marrying a very large slave owner in South Carolina. I would never in any way describe Aaron Burr as an abolition, even though he supported uh, a piece of legislation in New York calling for the gradual emancipation of slaves. So this is where we get, when we kind of look at the big picture, we can't fit them in one like heroic camp yeah. um, and one villainous camp because the decisions they're making um, reflect the ideas Burr is an, a man of the Enlightenment, but he's also a man of New York's elite. But if you want to celebrate anyone from New York <laughs> on the abolition issue, it should be John Jay and John Jay's son, because they're the ones who really pushed through the, the eventual Emancipation Act in New York, and that is until uh, the 1830s. So we're, we're really due for a wave of mm. Jay mania, <laughs> I think. Oh, well, right. Can I, can I yeah. just carry this forward a little bit? Because yeah. I think that's really important. Because, you know, after, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, um, after independence, uh, New York had, I think about 10% of the population was enslaved. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the same as in um, Missouri on the eve of the Civil War. Right. And in Missouri, s slaves were the second most valuable form of property. My first book was oh. about Jesse James, who was from a slave-owning family, who, who fought for the Confederacy as a Confederate guerrilla. And who, the reason we, he was famous it's because he brought politics into his, his story, um, making his, his bandit career about opposition to Reconstruction. Now, on the other side, though, to bring up this whole naughtiness, and I'll mm -hmm. also mention New York in a sec, um, there were slave owners in Missouri who were opposed to secession, because Missouri was up in the air, mm -hmm. because of slavery. Because if they seceded, they would have an international boundary on three sides, and they would lose the benefit of the Fugitive Slave Act. So being pro-slavery made a lot of people pro-union in Missouri. <laughs> now, in, in New York, New York was uh, a state that was highly tied, uh, city, excuse me, in 
most important city in New York State, highly tied to the slave economy as a financial and shipping center and as an important finishing center for the textile trade. Now, a good example of that is my great, 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 great grandfather, who was from a Puritan family in New England, settled in New York around 1820, and was the master of a schooner that sailed between New York and New Orleans. That meant he was shipping textiles, shipping cotton. And then he later opened a mercantile house on uh, Canal and Bowery in what's now Chinatown um, that was a textile business. This was the big business of New York. And so, you know, he, his livelihood was dependent on slavery. Slaves, the, in 1860, the census counted um, all investment nationwide in all manufacturing, all factories, and all railroads was about $2.5 billion. In slaves, $3 billion. It was, slavery was bigger than everything else, in, in, in not everything else, but all manufacturing, all railroads. And New York as a financial center, an insurance center, was heavily invested in the South, so that when the South seceded, the New York mayor, Fernando Wood, famously suggested that New York should secede too <laughs> and become a free city so they could keep their ties with the slave-driven uh, economy in the South. So it gets really messy and naughty, and, and people, you know, like they were torn between their national patriotism and their financial interests, which yeah. they might not, never own a slave, but they're heavily invested in the South. And, you know, Cornelius Vanderbilt probably had no opinions about slavery, but he had heavy investments in the South with, with coastal shipping lines and whatnot. But when push came to shove, he was very patriotic, like most people in the North, and he ended up giving a million-dollar steamship to the U.S. Navy, then complaining they didn't give it back. But anyway, <laughs> you know, it's, people are messy and complicated. They have, they have right. contradictory interests and views. Yeah. And it, it does. It breaks down that whole view of... of um, you know, the, the good north and the bad south. This helps when I talk in the south. I mention <laughs> these things. <laughs> that okay. makes them feel better. No, uh, this, is, this is where, as a, as a legal historian, this is where slavery is very complicated. One of the things I wrote about in White Trash is that one of the myths that has been generated is when we think of the class system, we simplify it in the South. We think that there's the planter, and then there's something called the yeoman class. Okay, I talked about how Western migration has this neutral term, the settler. Well, in the South, the yeoman class, um, the problem is that there was no unifying, non-slave-owning yeoman class. The yeoman class could be divided because there were yeomans who owned slaves, and often, they inherited their slaves. Mm. So one of the things that's really essential about understanding the power of the planter class is not only slaves were important, an important form of credit. Like you could get loans if you, had a, a, if you owned a slave. You also could see that people who may look in the census as being small slave owners that's not enough. You actually, if you trace their connections, you'll realize that they're in some way married into or related to a powerful slave planter class. Um, and that's, that's, I think, the other thing we have to think about in the class system. One of the people I quote from 1860, this man, Daniel Hundley, when he talked about the class system in the South, he had six different classes. Even today, we want to simplify the class. We sort of assume, well, there's like the super 1%, and then there's the professional class. Or we used to like to think that there's three classes, you know, the wealthy and the middle class and the poor. But every historical period imagines class in a new way based on how politics is changing, economics is changing, and the way in which class is connected to the exercise of power. Um, and that's one of the things that I think when we think about slavery, we have to realize that it was very intimately tied to wealth, to class position, in addition to how we normally think about it as just a political ideology, about whether, the conf whether you're pro-Confederacy or whether you're pro-Union. Well, I, I want to uh, kind of ask a question and, and see mm -hmm. if you agree with me on mm -hmm. this or not. Mm -hmm. um, that it, it's interesting how often there are, there are political ideologies that, that emerge that clearly have a, a basis in people's personal interests. So you can see the kind of connection to the way the world is. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes the world starts to change, but those political ideologies linger. Right. And that's not to judge people. I, you know, I, I think that we, we have political views today that are rooted in a past you know, that, that doesn't reflect the way the world works today. Mm 
and that's that's a very interesting thing. And one of them is, you know, Jacksonians were, and again, you know, you can certainly disagree. Mm. You know, there was this idea of, um, of, you know, that I mentioned earlier this this kind of Whig idea of the government and the wealthy should kind of work together. And the Jacksonians believe that that was giving the wealthy who already had every advantage more advantages. So corporations were seen as kind of a, um, privately run public works, that there, was this not, there wasn't a clear boundary between public and private interests in corporations. They're usually chartered one by one by the state. They often had limitations on what they could do in their corporate charters, public obligations. But still, like the idea of limited liability, sometimes they got monopolies. These things were seen as special advantages that were given to the wealthy, which makes sense in, a, in an economy that's pretty flat, in which there aren't any giant businesses like came about in the late 19th century. But you get to the late 19th century, and people who were opposed <laughs> to this kind of government activism, which they saw as giving rewards to the wealthy, you know, the Jacksonians many of them had this kind of laissez-faire view of keep the government out. Now, the government did a lot of things, so I don't want to exaggerate. But you, know, you get to the, the post-Civil War period, and the Democratic Party is not you know, the party of the people. It's, it's, it's driven by you know, resentment of Reconstruction, and, but they still have a lot of these ideologies that carry back to a period before the Industrial de Revolution of the late 19th century and the rise of these giant corporations. So what happened is you eventually got you know, populists and progressives who say the government should regulate corporations. And, and, but that actually ran counter to an older view that was rooted in a different kind of economy. Right. I, mean, right. I mean, what are your thoughts on that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the, the problems is it's very complicated to separate I think you're exactly right. Ideologies can persist. They can morph, but they mm. can persist, and they often can be and they out can of splinter. You're right, and, and they can be out of touch with people's, you know, real interests. And that's one of the things that has always fascinated me is that one of the myths that Americans often tell themselves is that we are a more pragmatic people, that we understand our self-interest. But I don't think anyone believes that today. <laughs> but in fact, politics is very irrational, and I think it's hard. To, for people to escape the ideology or the political language that they grew up with, even if it is changing. Um, it's hard for people, they can see certain things. They can see um, you know, the racial politics that's involved in Reconstruction and how that is, is ma manipulated. But I think this is you know, the, the question that you're raising about this whole problem of whether the go government intervention is good and who it's good for. Mm. Um, when we think about the growth of industry, and this is one of the things that I looked at in White Trash, and we look at the growth of southern textiles, um, this is a world that none of us would support today mm. because the major form of labor being exploited was children and women. Men did not work in the textile. Um, and this is one of the points I always like to remind people about when we think about even those, and as, as you well know, racism it has not ended now and doesn't end with the end of slavery. But we had ch child labor was legal into this country until 1919. So this is often what's left out of industrialization. Um, and it's a completely different world when we think about um, whose interests does state intervention serve? And, and TJ is working on the progressives right now. One of their major interests was to address this, this question of child labor or women's labor. And then as we know later, that runs into tensions with people who are women's rights activists because that language of protecting dependents or people who are vulnerable runs against the other rhetoric that we want to treat people as equals. So yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things. You can see moments where ideologies are in conflict. And you can see how people at the time are not going to be able to see what we can see from hindsight about how, you know, how this is going to play out in the future. Yeah, and there's one thing I, I would love mm. to, please, if you haven't thought of any questions, mm. think mm -hmm. of some. And they can be very specific, too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, this, this question of, 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 there's two sides to that. One is, 
um, you know, we have a different perspective. We look back, and we should have that perspective. Um, and we can say, wow, that's interesting. They're talking about these problems using a language from an earlier era. And yet, um, we can see, because we know where things go, that they don't. But often, what will happen is people will, um, that because we don't live in that world, sometimes we don't see the logic of what people do. And historians are guilty of this as well as the general public. Right. So one of my examples is yeah. Custer. And there are a lot of reasons to be critical of Custer. Um, my, it, even though he was a great subject, he was just such a contradictory, volatile person. But um, one thing that I was surprised by when I wrote about him is that he was actually consistently good at being a soldier, at being a commander. <laughs> And that, of course, that's what we all think he's terrible at because of the way he died. <laughs> um, and yet, it, there's, it, there's one thing, for example, um, in, in his second court martial and conviction in 1867, <laughs> he was suspended for a year. He came back. He was brought back to lead a column on, um, against the Southern Cheyennes in 1868 in the Washita campaign. And the well, first thing he did was order his men. He came back, and he ordered all the different companies he had 11 of 12 companies of his regiments, the 7th Cavalry, and he ordered them to exchange horses so that each company had the same color horse. And now the men said, oh, you know, the officer said, I've been training my horse, that this is terrible. It's just Custer and his obsession with appearances, because he was obsessed with appearances. And yet, this actually, there's a logic to it. He was going into, very rare in the, in the West, the regiment was going into a masked battle. And as a commander on the field, there were no radios. He's not up in a hot air balloon <laughs> watching. He's, he's going to go up on a hill, and he's going to be looking where his men are, and then he's going to send a runner to go and tell so-and-so to do this and that. So to be able to simply fight his units, as they would say, to understand where his companies were and to give them orders, he's got to see in an instant, oh, Troop F is over there. Troop A is over here. And, and to be able to see. There's, there is an actual tactical logic to it. And um, interestingly, his harshest critic for carrying out this coloring the horses, as they called it, was Captain Frederick Benteen, one of his great enemies in the regiment. And at the Reno Court of Inquiry, when there was a trial two years after Custer was killed by the Army to see if his second-in-command was guilty of, of causing this disaster, Benteen testified that when he arrived on the scene of the battle, he knew they were in retreat because he could see the gray horse <laughs> troop coming back at full speed. In other words, the great critic of this move demonstrated in his testimony the logic of it. And that's a little warning for us on the other side of things, is that we really have to get into the logic. People always make mistakes. They misread situations. They, they, they do things and that have terrible outcomes. And yet it's our job when we write about events and about human beings to understand what their logic was. Very rarely do people do things because they're crazy. They usually do things out of a, a series of, of logical steps, which we have to get inside and understand. So it can be a disastrous choice, but we have to understand why someone would make that choice. And that involves getting inside the mindset and all these things we're talking about. You know, it reminds me of, I made a joke once at a history conference that I have a tendency to study people who are losers. And this is the other issue that when, you know, as you're talking about, since we know Custer's end, to what degree do we read back into that person's life because of the, 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 the mistake that's kind of the center of that person's story and the way their story of their life is told? Um, and then we reorganize their life to fit how it ends. And this is part of the problem. It's not only sort of do we kind of like heroes and, and dismiss villains, but we also, when we are, whether it's you know, historians or it's people who are writing more popular versions, that we inherit narratives about these people and we often um, are not as suspicious as we should be about the, where that narrative comes from and this kind of reading back into someone's past when they are kind of dismissed in the loser camp um, as opposed to the winner camp. And that's why Thomas Jefferson, even though his stock is down right now, 
but he'll come back. Don't he'll worry. He'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> He's been kind of Jefferson, the most, yeah. you know, favorite president of all time. You know, right up there with Lincoln. Uh, but we have this problem, and this is what one of the things I had to do with Burr that was so essential is that because there was so much fiction written about him, so much negative material. I used to make a joke when the Burr book came out that relying on Hamilton's opinion of Aaron Burr was like relying on Ken Starr's opinion of Bill Clinton. Um, you can't just sort of accept what someone says in a letter and assume that it's true. You have to know the origin. And that's what often what I had to do is trace down the origins of these myths. And, and a lot of the things that people would claim happened uh, with Burr that, that they claim are part of the duel or, or evidence about him came from extremely unreliable sources, not just Hamilton as his political rival, but also newspapers, newspapers that had their own political agenda. Um, one of the major political hacks in New York was a man, and I love his name because his last name was Cheatham, <laughs> uh, aligned himself with another faction, the Clinton faction. This is not the Bill and Hillary Clinton faction. This is the Dewey DeWitt Clinton and the George Winton, the George Clinton faction, uh, and went on a tear to kind of print a whole series of things about Burr that if you think the newspapers today uh, are, are, are are uh, loose with the facts. Back in the 1800s, they could publish anything and nobody cared. So a lot of the accusations and the portraits, you know, describing Burr as cunning or describing him uh, as Satan, these come from extremely unreliable sources, but then they kind of gained legitimacy over time because they were repeated by 19, famous 19th century biographers who don't adhere to the same standards of evidence that we do. And then they get woven into the story as well. So part of what a good contemporary historian has to do is not only tell a story of what happened, but try to unravel and explain the myths that often are attached to very public, well-known figures um, who we think we know, but often we don't. Yeah, know why you know something. That's, I think, is a good motto. Right. Um, we only have a few minutes left, yeah. but are there any questions? Yes, sir. So his question was, um, there's an old saying that history is written by the victors. So how should non-historians be reading history and doing a good job of it and being s properly skeptical, et cetera? And I think that's a great question for Nancy to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one particular bias. I mean, if you do pick up my book, particularly White Trash, you'll realize that there are a hun over 100 pages of endnotes. Um, and th this is why my history took, you know, seven years to research and write. So I, I happen to, that's where I'm very academic. I mean, I think my prose is readable. It can be read by people who aren't specialists. I don't, you know, bury my argument in jargon. But I do think that uh, one way to kind of judge a book is not by the cover, <laughs> but by the, the, the amount of research that is used to substantiate the claims that you're making. So I always look at the back of the book. Don't kind of ignore that, because I think that is a good way to evaluate uh, how you feel about that book. And then also, um, you, you want to, when you read a book, you want to understand, often people will explain their approach. Um, what are, and, and that's actually healthy. They'll explain what their biases are. They'll explain why they're writing about this topic. Um, and then you, you, under, you hope that when they get to a point where their bias might influence their outcome, that they'll be open about that. And that's, that's another problem because often in history, we want just the narrative to kind of move along. Um, and there are moments, and I'm sure, you know, TJ feels the same way. There are moments in my Burr biography where you have to pause and say, we don't know exactly what happened here. Yeah, that, that kind of honesty, I think, is very, mm -hmm. you get a sense of the, the author's honesty, their willingness to uh, allow that they d simply don't know some things, or that there's different ways of reading things. Um, if endnotes are just like a source, 
and that's all it is. Uh, that's not as nice as when they, an author will use the end notes to kind of like kind of elaborate a little bit. This can be read this way. I try to do that. I try right. to say some, you know, you will read, if you read such and such, they'll give you a different argument. You know, like when you, when you see that, you know you're onto somebody who, they may not, you never have the final version. All history is revisionist. Right. But you know, when somebody is really, honesty is a priority. And so you have a point of view, you're willing to accept, you know what, someone could come along and, 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 and they have, other people have different views that are legitimate and they may, you know what, they may end up being right. You know, that's, that says a lot. Use an example. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll repeat. Right. Mm -hmm. So her question was about um, revisionism that um, is specifically aimed at um, trying to pitch a specific political viewpoint. And uh, um, using the subject of Japan and how she uh, ran into somebody who's, who's teaching uh, the history of Japan and, and Pearl Harbor and suggesting that it might have been uh, not entirely unjustified. Um, now, this is a huge subject, but I would like to just say a couple things. One, with education, it's difficult. Um, education tends to, primary and secondary education, tends to get flattened down because people are usually afraid of controversies. Um, second of all, um, there's, you can usually tell, there's always going to be revision in new thinking, but you can tell the difference between people who are usually tell the difference between people who are arguing a, a ideological viewpoint, polemical viewpoint, and those who aren't. Because when you're talking about things that, that matter to people at the time, then, then that's different. And sometimes issues at the time have been ignored by um, people who in the past were pitching. There's revisionism in the past too. And the version of history you may have had may actually be revisionist. <laughs> and um, that, you know, that, for example, the Civil War, people would, for a while, it was obvious to everybody, as Lincoln said in his second inaugural address, one of the best concise explanations of the Civil War, um, slavery was the cause, everybody knew. Um, and then we went through a period after Reconstruction fell when, when it was fashionable to say it was some sort of vague states' rights. And then people got upset when you brought up slavery because they felt like it was, but if you look at the time, that's what everyone talked about. So, so there's, you can tell the difference between, between people who are honestly trying to argue, r assess these things, and as I just said, you know, they're being honest about disputes and con contradictory evidence, and people who are trying to pitch a viewpoint. Right, because, I mean, as you know, at times of war, the one of the things that, uh, um, uh, Jill Lepore wrote this really interesting book about King Philip's War that's in the, um, you know, colonial period, and the, the problem of when you have the colonists who record everything that happens, and Native Americans did not keep records, 
um, how do you read those documents to, to understand that war does have two sides, and in fact, often more than two sides? Um, and we have, to, we have to sort of realize, for example, the American Revolution. Um, for many Americans, it's often seen as if the American Revolution, there wasn't another side. Everyone was a patriot, everyone supported the revolution, when in fact, at least a quarter, if not more, remained loyal to Great Britain. So their story needs to be told in addition to assuming that everyone at a time of war is, is in complete agreement about what they think this war is about. Because as we know, even today, any war that occurs is going to be a, a matter of political dispute, a matter of political difference, different opinions. And the best history brings all of that into play, trying to kind of capture these differences and not, as you said, flatten them down. That's exactly with the amount of time we have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.